Hi, this is Marvin from Hygiene Strength and Conditioning. This month's content is a little bit different from before. I am going to present to you an audio recording from my phone call with Nick D'Agostino. Nick is a starting strength staff coach and a doctor in physical therapy. I had the pleasure of being coached by Nick for almost two years, and I know from my own experience that his practice in physical therapy is different from what I have seen so far in Singapore. In this conversation, I wanted to understand more about what he does in the clinic as well as his mental model in treating his patients. I also wanted to know what is his view about the quote-unquote the usual suspect in physical therapy, things like imbalances, tightness, etc. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Nick, how, how do you define your profession as a doctor in physical well, therapy? How about, so, because that's going to be a tough, how do I define mm -hmm. my profession? I don't think about it in that kind of term. Like what I've been trying to do as like a coach and as, mm -hmm. as a therapist is I'm trying to help people in a way that aligns with what I think is the right way to help people or the best way to help people even though from like a legal sense you know mm -hmm. i have to have to have to have this kind of division i i think about this as all one thing and my ability is, you know my, what i've been trying to do is make myself as useful as i possibly can be mm -hmm. in as large or uh, as a as many kind of circumstances that I can be to help mm -hmm. the type of person that wants to get better, uh, you know, th you know, or stronger mm -hmm. through, uh, you know, through resistance training or barbell training. Yeah, yeah. In this case, your, your rule is only defined when someone comes to you and then they, they explain to you how, uh, the, how they probably need your help. And then in this case, you see how you can be of help for that person, right? Exactly. Um, that's how I think about mm -hmm. it. You know, that's that's how I think about it in my like relationship to mm -hmm. the person in front of me. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I don't think about it in in like like categorically, like okay. physical therapist or coach or a coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to ask specifically um, about the this group of people that approach you as a physical therapist, right? Actually. How's the I client? Because mm -hmm. yeah, I kind of know what I think you want to know. Mm -hmm. um, you want you basically want you want to understand better understand my mental model for how I kind of approach treating people. Is that right? That is part of it. It it will be yeah. one of the very major component that I want to understand. Mm -hmm. Sure. I I also want to know what is the background of this group of people. Are, are they also like lifters or are they also, for example, athletes of other sports or are they, I mean, like people of general population that doesn't do um, much of this kind of sport, but for example, had a fall or for example, sprained their back uh, or what kind of people are you dealing with, for example, in your clinic? Um, yes, is, mm. so, that's great. So in the clinic, I would probably say if I were to break this down, probably... 80% mm -hmm. of the people that I'm working with are more, you know, 75, 80% of the people are general population. Okay. All right. Then probably we'll say, you know, somewhere around 15 or so percent, mm -hmm. 10 to percent would be athletes or, or like weekend warrior type of people okay, that are okay, okay. different different sports besides lifting, you know, or, or, mm -hmm. or, or since training related, it might be, mm -hmm. you know, triathlon, soccer player, volleyball, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. And also because we're connected to, or we, because we were, uh, connected to, um, the, the local college, mm -hmm. we also get, uh, we also do consults and, and some sessions with, um, with the student athletes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. with student athletes mm -hmm. and then i want to say probably in the clinic mm -hmm. you know five to ten percent would be people that are uh, we'll say resistance 
yes. training athlete. related mm-hmm. kind mm-hmm. of you know athlete. They might have a bodybuilding background, a powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, CrossFit, you mm-hmm. know, something like that. And they're coming to us. Those people usually seek us out specifically because we have a reputation, mm-hmm. you know, within the community of, of helping that kind of athlete. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Understand. Well. Yeah. So in this case, when they come to you, is there any kind of general issues that they are dealing with? Like, for example, if I'm a doctor in a hospital or in a clinic, for example, I'm a general practitioner, probably, I don't know, maybe more than 50% is like just common cold, flu, those kind of uh, thing, right? Is, is there any sure. kind of like a, a general issues that you would say, <laughs> Yeah, I would say like the number one Okay. Pro- probably is low back pain okay. of, of varying different things, right? There's, but we'll just say coming in for like a low back pain related issue is, is is probably, especially from the general population, is mm-hmm. is probably the number one. Okay. And then after that, you know, the second place would be something like I would say knee, shoulder, and neck are all kind <laughs> of together. You know, okay. after that in like a kind of like a tie for second place and then you know the other body parts ankles wrists elbows those are probably those are probably the least amount okay i would say low back being the most and then uh you know knees knee shoulder and neck pain being like the next chunk and then uh, the other stuff is definitely less frequently, but yes, yes, it, yes, it comes in waves. <laughs> it, it's it's quite interesting because the the people that finally comes to strength training are, I mean, it's quite similar, right? If for example they come because of certain issue, I want to do strength training. N- number one issue is oh, I I have a lot of back pain, and then yes, neck pain, whatever, shoulder, whatever. Um, that is that is the the second tier, right? The, but. Yeah, the, the, the most common yes. yes. everything else. Oh, all yeah. right. Interesting, interesting. In general, so ma- mainly yeah. the clientele are the, the general population. Now, do you actually treat these people, general population, differently from people who already understand, I mean, or already uh, involved in a certain sport, especially if they are lifting? The answer is yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and part, you know, part of what I'm doing is I have to, I have a way it's going to sound bad. You have to, if you're going to, if you're going to use the audio, you have to, you have to make this sound good. Yeah. So most of the time when the general population is coming to me with something like back pain or even knee pain or, you know, lots of different kinds of aches and pains, Mm -hmm. a lot of times I'm steering them towards doing some kind of some kind of barbell training. Okay. Like I just, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm trying, I'm, and I'm introducing it in a way that makes it feel the as least threatening as possible. You know, if someone from the general general population comes in with back pain, mm-hmm. and then I just kind of straight up kind of say we're going to do deadlifts, mm-hmm. that might not go over very well. You know, they right. have, you know, they have these ideas. If they know what that is, they probably have ideas about it that are not positive. The answer, the answer is every time I encounter a person, mm-hmm. the general strategy is the same. Yeah. The general strategy yeah. is the same, but the the profile of the person in front of me mm-hmm. is going to dictate exactly what I'm trying to do. How you package it. To how them. I exactly how I exactly how I get you them to, it. Mm-hmm. to do the thing is going to mm-hmm. be you know the types of conversations I might have are, are going to be a little different. But you know when. I think this is so when, when someone comes to me, the first thing I'm, you know, after I've ruled out that something is a red flag or something is bad that I think they need to see another practitioner or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. After those things are kind of gone, what I'm trying to figure out is whether I want this person to avoid the things that are causing them pain. I mm-hmm. want them to approach the things that are causing them pain or whether I want to almost reformulate their approach. So if they've been approaching and I still think they want to approach, but they've been an approaching in a way that's been flaring them up, I want to find mm-hmm. a new way to approach. So those are my three general 
things I'm trying to figure out. General population, athlete, barbell trainee, right? I'm, you know, do we need to avoid this? Do we need to approach this? Do we need to reformulate an approach if you have been kind of approaching this? You know, what, which one of those I choose is going to be dependent on what the person's been doing. If they've been avoiding, if that's what their current pattern of behavior was when they come to me, mm-hmm. a lot of times I'm going to try to encourage and, and try to find a way to approach. They've been just banging their head against the wall and kind of constantly doing the thing and, and, and not like changing. A mm-hmm. lot of times I'm going to go to avoid. We're going to find, you know, because they've been doing that. I'm literally doing the opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to try to find a way to kind of back off to let things calm down uh, and vice versa. Like if they're somewhere in this kind of middle, maybe they've, maybe they've been dealing with this for a long time. This is not like a new issue. It's kind of more of a chronic thing. Yeah. Uh, and you know, laying off is not really the appropriate, right. uh, total, the deal. I'm going to try to find a way to approach mm-hmm. that yes. different yes. from what they've been doing. Uh, and more gra- and, you know, as more gradual, a different rate of, of, of exposure. Now, mm-hmm. this is another important thing. Within, within physical therapy, there's kind of five things that I'm trying to treat. Each person has a different number of those five things. The first thing, the most obvious thing, the thing you're prob- you probably think about, is tissue capacity. We'll say tissue-related capacity. This could be strength. Mobility, flexibility, this is stuff related to what's going on with the the anatomy and the physiology. That's the first thing. The second thing is belief structure. This is like things like fear, apprehension, anxiety, right? This is something Mm -hmm. else when I'm working with the patient. The next thing I'm going to say is maladaptive movement strategies. Okay, this is somebody, this is, this is when some, someone is either doing something constantly that, that, that's pissing things off and like refusing to change, mm. or it could be somebody who's been, who's had an ache or pain for a long time, and so now a bunch of their movement patterns are centered around avoiding exposing that to load. Mm. So like mm. be somebody, in a, a quick example here, would be somebody with low back pain and you notice when they're moving around, they're always trying to stay vertical, no matter what. Mm. Independent of barbell training. You watch them move around in everyday life and their movement becomes very deliberate, very yeah. thoughtful, kind of slow, right? Mm-hmm. Their their movement strategies are not it's it's not variable. They're not they're not moving freely. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. Another thing, just straight up, right? Pain relief. Hmm. Trying to is—is is there anything that I can do, or that I can teach them to do, that modifies their symptoms, that lets them do some of these other types of things? So that could be things like a lacrosse ball, a stretch, ice, heat, over-the-counter pain medications, right? Okay. All these, all of these types of things. Is there anything I can do to? To not, if that's a problem for them, is there anything I can do to, to push that in the right direction? And then the last thing would be adherence. What is the person, what can I actually get this person to do? Are they going to do everything that I say or do I, you know, that I think is best? Or do I have to scale? Am I, am I, am I scaling what I think is best to what I think is most likely going to be what this person's going to do? So that at least they do something first and try to work on that, right? Yeah, adherence is the idea in like, if we compare it to barbell training, it's the same idea as consistency is mm-hmm. king. Okay. Right? It doesn't matter. Like if I have to alter, if someone's trying to get started training, right? And whatever I'm doing and I'm, I'm running them through a linear progression. And even if they're getting stronger, they kind of hate it because mm. it's hard and all these other types of things. Mm. I'm going to do something to the program to increase the likelihood that they adhere to it. You know, you know, whatever, whatever that is, you know, it's mm. going to depend on the per- person, right? But you, you, you know, it's prioritizing. It's it's making things for the person either easy, fun, or meaningful. 
if I were to say that's kind of what I'm thinking about with mm-hmm. adherence. If I can make the thing easier, if they if they're struggling with it, right? Now, so now, right, I have those five things. Yeah. I'm interviewing the person in front of me. Yeah. First, I'm trying to figure out what does this person need, right? That this person might need tissue capacity mm-hmm. related things, and they might need pain relief. Okay. They might not need it here. Maybe every, I, I know from this interaction, I'm not worried about adherence. I know that I'm not worried about the maladaptive movement strategy stuff. Mm. That's not there. I know that, um, the belief uh, structure is fine. The belief structure is okay. There's mm. not a lot of fear and apprehension, right? There's, yeah. I can tell just from the interaction there's, that's not there. Those are the two things. Now, once I have those things, then I'm figuring out the kind of, you know, the, in the general strategy. Now I know what I'm going to work on. Now I'm either going to do approach, avoid, reformulate approach. Okay. This, you know, so it's like if I'm if I'm layering it. Now that is kind of those are the types of things. You know, whether or not be, because if I'm dealing with someone who's in a general the general population and I get the sense that they're going to be, there's going to be some, there are some beliefs re- around lifting weights in, in any kind of way. The approach that I'm taking is going to be different. I'm not going to call things a deadlift, right? Mm. I'm going to say, we're going to practice lifting things from up the floor. Off the floor you know, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, I because we lift things up off the floor all the time. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to do this even if you have back pain. Mm-hmm. Right. So then um, I can tell you the approach, the literally exact thing I do. I took this from from someone else, but it was such a good idea that mm-hmm. uh, I just use it all the time in clinic. In our clinic, we use dynamometers to measure force output at specific joints or how, you know, so we're measuring like exactly how much force the person can do with knee extension or whatever it is that Mm. we're trying to measure. Mm. So what I, what I did is I I hooked the dynamometer up to like one of those tricep push down bars. Okay. And then I hook it underneath a band peg on the deadlift platform. Mm -hmm. And I I tell the person, I want to measure how much, how much force they can push up lift from the floor. Mm -hmm. And so they do basically like I want, and I, I say, I want you to pull as hard as is comfortable. Right. Mm-hmm. And so uh, then they pull and then I always ask them, this is another thing. Whenever I think this is a, this is another thing here. Whenever, whenever I think belief structure is going to be a big thing, I try to find ways where the person accidentally violates their expectation of what they <laughs> so, okay. so I, I have them do the mm-hmm. and. Uh, basically an isometric rack pull scenario, right? That's okay. like, it's like a, a, yeah. an isometric, a little high, a little lower than a rack pull, a little higher than a deadlift. It's yeah. kind of like, yeah, 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 yeah. and they go, I pull it as hard as they comfortably. And then I ask them how much they think they did. It's almost always mm-hmm. way more. They, they think they'll do like 40 and they did a mm-hmm. hundred pounds. Right. Or something like that. Right. So, mm-hmm. it's, you know, so there's a, vi- there's an expectancy violation, right? Yeah. 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 So after I do this little thing where they now just, they just pulled and they lift, they, you know, they, they, they have back pain, but they still manage to do uh, something like a hundred. Usually it's like a, a, for most people it's, it's in this kind of 90 to one, 130 140 range is like the average person. this is in in pounds you, you are mentioning pounds. in pounds exactly. okay so okay, okay. no yes 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 so yes 40 yes, yes. to 60 but but that, they but they do not know what is how much because it's connected to the dynamometer right and the dynamometer okay. is registering okay. on my phone right, right so they have right, no right. idea how much right, right? so then right. they violate it then they say mm-hmm. like uh maybe 30 40 and i'm like oh no it's actually 120 really you know like kind of there then there's like and then i show them the thing and they're like wow i didn't know i you know didn't know i could do that mm-hmm. and i'm like in order for you know I'll, I'll say something i'll connect like that we need to practice doing this the next time you come in uh we're gonna start practicing lifting things up off the floor mm-hmm. i want to 
So, and I'll say like, I want to start at something that feels comfortable that I know you can do. So let's start with half of whatever you did on the dynamometer. Right. I'm like, does that sound? And I'll ask, does that sound reasonable to you? And they're like, I've never had someone be like, no, you know what I mean? Like, hmm. sure. Yeah. And now all of a sudden they pulled 120 and now from we, I got the buy-in mm-hmm. to start deadlifts next time at 60 pounds, you know what I mean? Or 65 or whatever it is. Like, right, and right, it's not, right, right, right. Be, they know that it's coming because we, most of the time I don't do it that first session because I'm usually working on, you know, with that example of back pain, I'm giving them a, after I do the, my testing and stuff, I'm giving them a few like stretching or pain relief exercises that make a difference fast. And then I say, next time we're going to start doing some kind of uh, uh, loading or something like that. Right. But that's how I, that's how I, whereas I would, well, that whole thing, uh, you know, if it was an athlete, the dynamometer we have only allows up to 330 pounds. So if mm-hmm. there's any doubt that someone's going to do more than that, I don't have to do it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it was an athlete, I'm not necessarily looking for buying. I'm like, we're just going to, I need to see where you're at. We're going to measure this. There's no, like, there's, there's none of the calling it a different name. Yeah, there's yeah, no yeah, yeah, yeah. The negotiation. I'm going to see where you're at. This is where I want you to be or something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, if that makes sense. I am. It's, it's the same concept, same strategy. It's just how you deliver it to different profile group, right? Different, yes. different group of people. Yes. Exactly. Yes, yes. In Singapore, when um, a client come back and report back, if, for example, they are seeing a physical therapist, a lot of issue seems to be related with tightness at certain part or, for example, imbalances between... Um, <laughs> Of, of certain muscle group or oh, yeah. your your uh, right side seems to be stronger than the left um, what is your view about this I think the vast majority of the time that is just nonsense I think that's the vast majority of the time I think that's looking in the wrong spot so the I could say the exceptions to that when that when kind of symmetry and things like that matter more are when somebody is coming off of some kind of traumatic surgery like the thing that just mm. first comes to mind if someone has an AT, ACL repair like then the muscle symmetry like between you know their quad strength you know getting their quad strength once the, the side that had surgery at least to ninety percent of the other side is important we have data that says that and that is that that but in the context that i think you're talking about right now is not that you're talking about somebody that just has a shoulder ache or pain or something they go in mm-hmm. and then they get told some kind of story about tightness and imbalances mm-hmm. not you're not talking about i'm not talking about oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. yeah you're not, you're not you know so in those cases um the vast majority of the time I don't think that that is going to be the like restoring the releasing the tightness or restoring this the strength is not necessarily going to be the main priority the the main yeah because it I think it distracts from zooming out and looking at what the what's going on so like this is gets to a general, this is, I guess, goes to kind of the, uh, a treatment philosophy thing, okay. right? And this is, you know, and, and figuring out what do you need to know from the person in order to, you know, treat them in order to, you know, in order to treat them, not physical exam stuff. There is stuff that you should know from that. But in general, like what I'm looking for when I'm treating a patient, I really want to understand what's important to them. What are the activities that they like to do that they can't do or that that's being interfered with, Mm -hmm. right? Because of the ache or pain. Mm -hmm. Once I know what's important, you know, basically I want to know what's important to them. I also really want to know what they think is going on about the scenario, right? I want to know uh, because what they, what they're thinking about what's going on and what they're most concerned or worried about are going to tell me whether or not I need to work on the belief structure aspect of that, of that other type of thing. Right. Um, 
you know, what's important to them, uh, you know, the general history, like what they've been doing for it and, uh, and, and, um, what they think about it, it's going to, that's going to shape how I'm going to create my strategy to help them. Mm. And I have a mental model for like treatment strategy that I kind of, that I'm using for almost, for almost everybody, some version of this. This is not mine. This is comes from this guy, Greg Lehman. I, I took his course back in like 2019 and mm. I thought it was a brilliant kind of easy way heuristic to like think about how, how you're treating the patient. Right. Um, and you basically have three buckets that, that I'm trying to, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm treating the patient with. And I'm, I'm, I'm literally, I'm trying to hit each of these three, bu- three buckets. Um, you know, and again, some of this depends on that other thing that I told you earlier, but yeah, you know, the first bucket is going to be loading, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time going to be loading the patient. Now, generally within the loading category, like I'm either load, I'm loading them generally and specifically. Right. So I, so meaning a general loading might be things like squats and deadlifts. Mm -hmm. Okay. A specific loading might be something like a knee extension or a, lateral raise or something like that, depending on, you know what I mean? So whatever, whatever it is, the exact thing is going on. So mm-hmm. general loading and depending on the circumstances, what I'm trying to do, likely a specific loading that is hard for them to compensate or move out of. That's really the goal of the specific loading. That's why it's a knee extension instead of a lunge because they can't use anything else but their quad. You okay. know what I'm saying? Uh, they can't, mm. can't, and compensatory movement out of it, right? That's why I'm usually either on one of those ends of the spectrum. Like I'm there, like, you know, I'm usually less in this middle area Mm. hitting this one thing that I want to hit or gross movement pattern, how you're doing, how you're doing, whatever it is that you're doing. Then, so that's the loading category. Then I have like a symptom modification category, right? This is things like ice, heat, lacrosse ball, the, you know, a massage, uh, uh, painkillers, right? Those are all at another, you know, if, if I'm thinking pain relief is something that's important to what's going on right now to this person, that's going to, you know, the symptom modification bucket, we're going to, we're going to, we're reaching there and see what we can do from that end of the spectrum. But I'm not, when I'm modifying, when I'm doing that, I'm, I am explaining it as we're trying to modify the symptoms to let, to, to either load you or the last bucket is the meaningful activity bucket. Mm. Once I've identified what's important to that person, I'm trying to find ways to scale and incorporate the things that are important to them in the treatment. Whether that's, you know, a lot of times the meaningful activity is more going to be in the homework bucket than it is going to be in the clinic. Mm. Uh, like let's say like they are, they love golf, right? And they've stopped playing golf because of the X, Y, Z ache or pain, mm-hmm. right? I'm like, the homework might be, I want you to go to the range mm-hmm. and hit 15 balls. And I want you to tell me how that went, right? Mm-hmm. I'm scaling, I'm using, I'm, I'm going to linear progress mm-hmm. in some way, their meaningful activity, um, uh, just based upon, and that meaningful activity, if I can do, do it in the clinic, great. You know, an example of something I can do in the clinic is things like throwing, right? If someone wants to throw again, right? And that's mm-hmm. important to them. So we have, we, you know, we, we would have, uh, there would be a loading aspect where we're doing things like presses or lap pull downs mm-hmm. or pins or deadlifts, whatever, right? Then there'd be this symptom modification aspect of it where they might be doing a lacrosse ball or some kind of, some kind of stretch or heat or something. And then there'd be this meaningful activity bucket where we're practicing, we're scaling how much the person is throwing and gradually building that up in both volume and intensity until they're pretty close to where they want to be. So in this case, if this person is a runner and for example, oh yeah, I'm feeling some kind of knee pain, for example. So on top of, for example, doing the loading and symptom modification, you probably ask the person, I want you to 
run for a mile, for example, and see how it goes. Exactly. That's exactly, you know, and then get back to me. And mm-hmm. then so I, I, my whole thing in the interaction, this goes back to this original question is not about trying, I'm not trying to find a, the one problem that I need to solve that's like weakness or tightness or something like mm, that. Mm. I'm zooming out. I'm trying to get a big picture of the person in front of me. Mm-hmm. What's important to them, what they think, um, what they're worried and concerned about, right? Mm. Then, you know, I'm trying to use those things along with these other models, these other ideas that I talked about right? The five things that I'm either trying to treat, right? And then I'm taking those five things and I'm plugging them into this other model of loading, symptom modification, and um, uh, meaningful activity. And then I'm trying to address each one of those. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the, the last thing is like the umbrella, which isn't, which is something you're just, you're treating with conversation. You're treating it Socratically is mm-hmm. the belief restructuring, right? So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, if I think that's an issue, right? So if the person doesn't have a belief restructuring, if they're not, the fear and apprehension is not, a, uh, is a much smaller part of the equation. And the, the pain itself, like the actual, the need to modify it mm-hmm. is a very small part of the equation. It might be just the loading and the meaningful activity, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. vice versa, if the pain is the whole picture for this person, there's going to be a bigger meaning. There's going to be a bigger symptom modification and cognitive restructuring kind of bucket mm-hmm. to this person. I want to also say mm-hmm. this is what I'm telling you, last thing, is very unique to how I approach this. And it, and honestly, I'm based how I and a lot of the people, like there's a small circle of physical therapists that think in this kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, mainstream way is what you're encountering. Hmm. They're trying to find a weakness. They're trying to find a tightness. Right. The thing they're telling their patient are causing things like fear and apprehension instead of reducing fear and apprehension. The whole, hmm. the, this is, you know, part of the reason why, uh, and I, and I, and I think of a lot of times it's, it's very validated, you know, rips strong distaste for physical therapy because it's some, a lot of times they're doing literally the opposite of what, yeah. Done. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but if I, I thought if I share this with you, these ideas, yeah. you can understand exactly how I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it makes, hopefully it kind of makes sense. And, uh, and, and, and at least parts of it, you might be able to use as yeah. a, you know, as a coach as and a kind coach, of, yes. you know, even, uh, even in this, you know, this going back from, you know, this first principle of action, you know, approach, avoid Mm -hmm. all the way to this end of how I'm designing some of the things that I'm doing. Right. Uh, You know, kind of walk through that. I have a little bit more specific question about the the symptom modification, right? You mentioned things like, for example, ice massage and everything, right? And I mean, when I first encountered starting strength, and then at that point of time, Baraki was still there. And then he kept yeah. saying that, hey, foam rolling is, is a, a waste of time, for example, those kind of things, yeah. right? On some of the podcast trips, you're like, oh, yeah, uh, for example, the, the manual therapy is, is probably not as useful as, as people might believe. I, I, I don't understand, yeah. I mean, like, what is your view about this? And um, yeah, for example, stretching as well, l- l- I mean, like... Yeah. Generally, people say, "Oh, yeah." I mean, like you do. You don't need to waste too much time stretching or those kind of stuff. So, what I'm doing, and like how how am I formulating my suggestions? Are there differences between these things? So the the, the quick answer is there's no real difference. None of those things are better or worse than the other thing mm-hmm. with the person in front of you. When I'm recommending those kinds of things, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm making sure, uh, I'm very clear that this is not the thing that's treating whatever it is that's going on. Mm-hmm. That this is the thing, this is something that's modifying your symptoms that might allow you mm-hmm. to either load it or exercise or do your meaningful activity. 
That's how you're using. So symptom modification things. It's not changing things. Um, we're not making tissues longer. We're not, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not breaking up adhesions. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like that going on. It's more of, does this feel good? Yes. Can you do this yourself? Does this cost little to no money or time? <laughs> you know, those kind of things, right, are my, like, criteria for recommending a symptom modification. I'm trying to use the person's experience as a way to help guide some of the suggestions. If somebody is telling me that uh, they really like massage, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. recommend mm -hmm. the lacrosse ball or the mm -hmm. foam roller, mm -hmm. here's a way that you can massage yourself. You know, if somebody if somebody is flared up and wants something to help calm things down afterwards, I'll ask them, you know, do you prefer ice or heat? Mm -hmm. Right. Do you, you know, I'm not saying that you should do ice or you should do heat. I am making, I'm trying to, exp in the way I'm asking questions and doing things, making that, the symptom modification bucket, the small part of the equation, that's something that might be helpful. I also say like when I'm explaining this or doing this, these kind of things to people, I'm making it so that they know that this is an as needed and you can take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. Then there are things that we might try that are useless. If you think that those things are useless, don't do them. Mm -hmm. And there are other things that you might try that might feel good and might allow you to do whatever the activity is that you want to do. Um, you might have positive, you know, the person may have positive past experiences that are influencing what's going to happen next. Those are the things I'll weigh into, you know, so it's like when you, when your back does flare up and you keep feels good, just take, you know, I want you to keep moving. And then when you can, you can take 10 minutes and put a heating pad on it and see if they see if that or a hot bath or whatever it is to see if that helps. Right. The recommendation of any of those treatments are not specific to the person's symptoms or to their effects. Yes. What they are is they're unique to what the person believes might help. So here's another thing, right? When the, and this happens occasionally, this happens occasionally more with this, not less with the general population, more with the athletic training population. If they've become obsessed with one symptom modification strategy, I make them not do that one. Mm. I make that happen less because that goes into the belief structure idea, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If the person believes that they need to stretch or cross ball or ice their thing after every single time or something bad might happen. When I think the symptom modification has infiltrated the belief structure mm. and is actually causing fear and apprehension, I try to take that away. Right. Right. This right. Is, you know, but this is, uh, uh, when it's a regular person, I'm not concerned about that. This is something you could try at home. If it feels good, keep doing it. If it doesn't, you don't have to do it, but you know, it's worth giving a try. Right. Ross Paul is only a dollar, right? Um, uh, go for it. I understand. I, I'm, I'm trying to reflect, right? What, what you mentioned just now, right? I, I do uh, see people, for example, oh yeah, they have shoulder issue. Every single time they come to the gym, they will take the band. And then that, that is the, the warm up that they need to do, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, at that point of time, I'm also guilty, right? And then Sean, which is my mentor and my boss, at that point of time, yeah. I was not as a mess as he yet. And then, like, hey, you know that this kind of thing is useless, right? And then, like, try, try, try to try to educate. So, I mean, to a certain extent, that is wrong, right and wrong at the same time, right? Wrong because yes. I mean, like, well, if this person um, need this kind of like. Um, um, what do you say? If, if, for example, those kind of band, of course, it's just a few minutes. It's, it's, it costs nothing, right? And it gives them more confidence in doing the, the, the lift, which is probably more beneficial for them. Why not let them do it, right? But at the same time, if 
the, the person becomes too reliant on that particular, oh, I need to do this. If not, then I, I it, it will get worse or whatever. Then in this case, probably it's better to, to, to uh, have a little bit more talk about that. Do, do, do you yes. think that that kind of this reflection is aligned with your understanding? <laughs> it is. Mm-hmm. It is. You're, you're making an assessment of what the person believes. Mm-hmm. And if you think the thing is causing more, but here's another thing that's important. Mm-hmm. How you take it away or how you challenge it mm-hmm. is important because you will, you need to do it in ways that uh, that that the person has control and that you're not violating trust. Mm-hmm. So let's just say the person is doing a bunch of warm-ups. Right. We'll say they're doing a bunch of diet, you know, they're, they're warming up 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. You ask them a question, you got to go, you know, out of the the five exercises that you're doing, Mm -hmm. right. What are the two that you think are most effective? Mm -hmm. Right. Let them choose the two. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you could say the next time, you know, you come in, I want you to only, I want, I want to try something. I want you to only do the two that you think are most effective and then let me know how that feels. Right. And then, you know, what you're trying to do is give when you're, when I found the strategy to get people to let go is not to confront them head on and let them and and tell them, you know, what you're, what you're doing is, is kind of bullshit or it's mm-hmm. not, this is not help. Maybe it helped you then it's not helping you, whatever it is, mm-hmm. the, the direct confrontation doesn't always work. The strategy that I feel like works much higher percentage is what I just said. Yes. You find they're doing a bunch of stretches. They're doing a bunch of lacrosse ball or whatever you either, you, you, what you do is you give them the autonomy to, to, to make decisions. Yes. Let them do it. Mm-hmm. Reduce the window of time mm-hmm. or the options, mm-hmm. depending on what the person is doing. That's going to, you know, mm-hmm. somebody obsessed with stretching or, uh, or, you know, that a lot of times I reduce the options, mm-hmm. uh, and that automatically reduces the time. Mm-hmm. If somebody's like foam rolling for a really long time or whatever it is, or doing that, I'm, 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 I'm like, you know, I, I want you to foam roll the next time you come in first. But I want to see how you feel if we only do five minutes instead of ten. Mm-hmm. You get to choose whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, make the five minutes count. Um, but you know, that's the way to get the person. Because what happens is, you want them to realize on their own that they don't need the thing as much as they mm-hmm. think they do. You don't want to just tell them that they don't need the thing. Right. You have to do it in that back because then yes. you tell them. You know, unless it's very high trust, right? Which occasionally happens. Like I have my coach in jujitsu uh, right now, very high trust between me and him. He'll tell me all the time, you have to stop doing that now. You know that to do that, stop doing that on other people. You know what I'm saying? Like he doesn't, and I'm not taking it as like, I'm not taking offense. I was, you know, even when I, things I was taking pride in what I was doing, he's like, the next time you do that, if you want to get good at this, you have to do that slower. You can't do that like this. You're just overpowering people. Whatever. Mm. You know, high trust, he can be blunt, straight. I'm not going to have emotional reaction. I'm mm. going to be like, all right, coach, whatever. Most relationships, mm. intermediate level there. You can't, you go you go hard on the front. What you're doing is bullshit. They're going to be like, <laughs> you. you know what I mean? Yes, like, yes, yes, yes. Versus, you know. Right, right, right. Like, I, I, yeah. I, I I understand what what uh, yeah your approach is yes 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 yeah right um, very briefly Nick because I know that this has been more than one hour so you mentioned yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ab- ab- about about the loading just now right you you mentioned that yeah. you you are giving them a general loading and a specific loading do you give them both i mean like it, it is both prescribed or for example there there are instances that you only give only the specific or only the general so this depends on this is a this is a very much it, it depends there it depends. are instances mm-hmm. where i'll give uh, only the general or only the specific okay. the, a, a good example here is for a lot of the back pain patients is very much it's very much general. The mm-hmm. only specific thing that I 
uh, do, and this it, some of this is an it depends, are some kind of isometric holds on um, or, or or back you know back extensions or back extension isometric holds, mm -hmm. but the vast majority of it is more general loading and symptom modification. Mm -hmm. You know, some form of lifting things from the floor, some form of you know, squatting or sit to standing, depending on the mm -hmm. person. Uh, but then there's a lot of times where there's more specific loading. An example might be that ACL patient again, mm -hmm. um, where they're doing, they might have, there's, you know, we might be, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be squatting and deadlifting in the pro deadlifting usually comes in fairly early, mm -hmm. but depending on the person and how bad their or how drastic their, uh, compensatory movement strategies are we might stay away from squats for a while but do a lot of quad stuff in order to get that a little bit more you know because yeah if we introduce the squat too early they just start shifting and turning like a mad person and it just totally looks <laughs> all right you know, i guess we, you know yeah. right you know right, so, right. The, so the answer is depends on the situation it really. does depend on the situation but as a general as a general heuristic a lot of times I'm looking in that kind of way, right? You know, there, there might be a general and a specific. And then as time goes on, a lot of times the certain things are phased out, you know, and mm -hmm. it becomes more, it becomes more generalized. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the, the good thing is too, we have the dynamometers, like a, a lot of clinics don't have that. I mean, as a, as if you're trying to look for a clinic that you want to recommend people to, right. Mm -hmm. As a coach, if you go into the clinic and they have a barbell set up in some way, a squat rack mm. or something, or at least one, and then they also have or use dynamometers, mm. that's usually, a, as a coach, that's a good cue to you that mm. you could set the person to the clinic. Because the, the, if the phys physical therapist that they're working with is using those two things, they can at least communicate to you in a similar, you know they're not afraid of load. Yeah. You know that they see load as the thing that needs to get better, not necessarily the tight muscle or whatever it is, yeah. the tightness. Really. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So this next set of questions is the, the last theme of, of this uh, interview, right? So in this case, right, if I, I if I, if myself, um, yeah. I'm injured, or for example, if my lifter are injured, right? Um and it's really, really difficult for us to find someone like you in Singapore. Yeah. How do we work with someone like you or, or yourself, right? Um, but in any case, for example, I'm, I'm, um, I'm working with my coach, for example, and I get an injury. How, how do I approach a physical therapist? And, and in this case, how do we actually work together um, to, 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 for example, solve the so, so what I do, and I've done this for, for a bunch of coaches, um, is I do a consultation with the person that's injured type of thing. And then I, I'm kind of assessing the situation on the call and figuring out, you know, I'm trying to figure out what's going on and how, how I would approach this with this person. Then after that call, I have a call with the coach. Um, the call with the coach. So I only do a one, a one charge thing. So the, the call with the, and you know, the call with the client is the same kind of consultation right here. It's a 30 to 60 minute call. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find out those types of things that I told you before. I'm yeah. trying to find out what's important to them, you know, what's going on, the story, what they think is going, is, is happening. And then I will have a, a follow-up call with the coach, which is usually fast. It's usually 10 to 15 minutes because hmm. I'm explaining, I'm giving them the gist of, I'm giving you or whoever else the gist of the thinking and how I would approach it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's up and to the coach to, to implement it. So it's not a, you know, there are certain times when, you know, in, in uh, there's been post-surgical kind of situations where I've done a few consults at like different time spreads, mm -hmm. but for, and there, there's been a couple of times where we've had to come up with a different strategy, but in general, a lot of, you know, most of the time it's, you know, a consult, 
they they talk to me. I get a I get a feel for what's going on, you know, and 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 come up and think about how I would approach this. Then I relay that information to the coach, and then the coach really kind of takes it and runs with it, yeah. and, uh, and and gets them back. Um, that's generally how I how I how I handle those. I don't do like I don't put them on like my true coach or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know that? yeah. And if I think there are scenarios where I had a uh, you know I had a I had a client who had a, a very traumatic injury, um, and you know he had he had to have sur- uh, a surgical repair to to get this thing fixed. And I sent him I I um, I didn't send him. I told him. He's got to do traditional physical therapy for about three months before we can kind of start picking stuff up. Mm. There's going to be, you know, if there's red flags or if I think that the case is more complicated, I also in that they need some other kind of intervention. I also let you know that yeah. too. You know, yeah. that, that's yeah. the, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And what I, what I do, so this is another last thing is just related to this is I made the consultation form on my website to be broad enough and to also, they tell me if the person's filling that out, I have like, you know, a who is your coach kind of section in mm-hmm. there to like know that a lot of the coaches give me a heads up. The people that use this the most are probably Grant and um, and uh, Zohar. I mean, I regularly do, you oh. know, regularly, uh, those, they, they, you know, other coaches, uh, Jared Neslin's done this with me a couple of times. There's a uh, man Shepard. There's, you know, so there's a, there's a, there's probably, you know, somewhere between five and 10 coaches who semi regularly do this exact kind of thing mm. with me that I, where I talk to the, uh, to the lifter first. To the lifter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I like to do that. Generally, I like to do that without the coach. If there is a language barrier, which has happened at least twice now with, so far, so far in, 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 in Israel. Israel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Where, where he's been on the call too, but generally I find that it's, it's better for me if they, if I can do it with just the one on one, it's mm-hmm. a better connection. I get a feeling, a better feeling of what's exactly going on. Right. They don't try to censor anything. If they want to, if they say something that might be like, you know, mm-hmm. they don't want to hurt the coach's feelings or something, whatever mm-hmm. is going on that, that goes away. Then I, I come up with a general strategy I explain the strategy to them so they know they're mm-hmm. on board, they get it. And then I explain more of the specifics of the strategy. I explain the general strategy to them, more of the specifics of the strategy to the, to the coach. coach. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Totally and understood. Along with it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. All right. I think, I think that is, that is enough for, for today. Like I, <laughs> I, I, I learn a lot. I, I learn a lot. I understand more, and yeah, I, I of course I, I know that um, the way you approach thing is is not like um, what we found here for for most of the physical therapists in Singapore because I've experienced it myself, and yeah. and um, yeah, I, I I I know that within this one hour call, I I've learned so much about general understanding of, of physical therapy and what is the general the idea of it. therapy is kind of going to look like or what yes. the person really should mm-hmm. be you know now that you saw those mo- now, now that i kind of explained a bunch of the the models mm-hmm. that i used right mm-hmm. if i were to even talk to you about it you'd completely understand what i was doing what you know right this is sort of the two or three aspects of that i think the person needs to be treated We're either gonna, uh, you know, approach or avoid, depending on what they were doing. Yeah. Right. Everything I would say would make total sense and the clarity of thinking. You could get, you totally yeah. get it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Is, that is rare. I mean, that's not. You're not like outside. Like I wouldn't go to any other clinic besides the one that I work at here. Like I'm not asking. You know, in uh, in in locally, there's people mm-hmm. that I for sure would would want to know their thoughts on. You know, but those people are like few and far between located in random places in the country. Okay, Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, helpful. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and um, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you soon, all right? Right. right. Bye-bye. Have a good one.